Well, um, Paul and I are excited to be back this week, home from England. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I broke my reading glasses just now. I have two good pairs, and one broke on the plane, and the second broke right then, right there. So these are Paul's. These will be fun. Um, yeah, and I've been up since 5 a.m., uh, which I'm using it because uh, a week from tomorrow, our first draft of our dissertations are due. So, um, yeah, things going on. But I'm excited to share this word with you. And then at the end, we're going to do something special that is related to Mother's Day. We're going to bring out some gifts we have and and ask you to just act on it by the Holy Spirit. Some of what you're going to see today, you can go ahead and put the first slide up. Some of what you're going to see, if you attend the Abbey, you will have seen it before. Uh, but A, I've never put it together quite like this before. This is basically what I did last Sunday morning at a live church in Lincoln, England. And I felt impressed to bring part of it today. And then at the end, I have a word that is specifically for this church. So again, you know, I kind of want to say, you know, like, uh, Christoph's not here today, our resident American Airlines pilot, but don't you love it when they go, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight? Don't you love that moment? I just go, I will now do that because I have your permission, sir. I just do, and, I, and then I ask for things I need and just get comfortable. And um, so I just kind of want to give you, it's that kind of morning today. I just want to give you permission. Maybe I secretly want to be a pilot. Maybe that's my problem. But I just want to say, you, you, the seatbelt sign's not even on. I mean, don't leave, but the seatbelt sign's not even on. Uh, just sit back, relax. There's no beverage service on this flight. However, unless you got your own, um, but we're here together and it's the kind of morning where we can just think together about a lot of things. And, uh, I hope you just really enjoy it because I plan to. So let's start with some Mother's Day things. First of all, this is one about the school year. So on the August mom says, you know very well you can't wear a striped shirt with plaid shorts to school, darling. Now don't forget your shiny new lunchbox. That's the August mom. The May mom says, eh, it kind of looks clean, whatever. And don't forget your lunchable kid. Anybody ever have a school year like that? Thank you for your honesty. If you don't, we'll, um, I don't know, start a website and teach the world. Um, have you heard that joke that the reason charcuterie is so popular is because it's a generation raised on Lunchables? <laughs> and to this day, like at lunch, I promise you, I'm going to be going, I think I'll have the charcuterie. Let's just eat little meat and cheese. Um, even Esther's Lunchables don't bother me much. Here's one. This is fun. What do you think? Having a weird mom builds character. Thank you. Oh, look. Well, that is why I put that up there. My, that was my son, if you're new among us, that was one of our three sons uh, clapping for that. They don't think I'm weird. I lied, you might. Okay, uh, here's one. This one's not funny, but I do want to make a point with this one. I'm raising my sons to not just value women, but to see them as equals, partners, and capable of just as much as anyone. First, I want to say, I really value the fact that we have a church that believes in that. Second, I want to say, isn't it sad you'd have to write that out? Just as capable as much as anyone? <laughs> like, that's, that's almost sad the way it's worded, isn't it? <laughs> you know, like, but I do want to honor my sons and say that we have that kind of household, and I feel like a bunch of you here can attest to that too, because... We have a gospel for all that it says. There's a place that says in Christ there's no, not neither male nor female. I know there are differences, but at the same time, isn't it great to honor one another and not have a hierarchy happening that's hurtful? So with that, I meant that as real honor, even though he did clap that I'm weird. Um, there's real honor there. Uh, how many of you think if you raise sons that way, it helps them in marriage one day. Just leaving that where it is, where it landed. Okay, here's one. Now you get to laugh. Let's get real. Um, my kids, whenever I sit down for any reason. And here's the thing. 
That could be one child, couldn't it? It doesn't take as many. This is not just a, um, a meme for people with multiple children. This, uh, yeah. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? When they're little. Also when they're older. No, just kidding. <laughs> and then here's the last one. This is just cute. There is a legend that if you go take a shower and scream out loud, Mom, three times a nice lady appears bringing you the towel you forgot. It could have also said toilet paper. <laughs> but there is a sense in which motherhood, you can lose yourself in the role. And also, we're conscious this morning that there are people who are missing mothers, mothers in heaven, or people who, for, for whatever reason, that issue is not always comfort and joy. And so we're conscious of the fact that Mother's Day brings us to a lot of places where we can both laugh and reflect. And I want to declare whatever state you're in this morning, this is a place of intense, authentic optimism. That we believe that the Bible is true and real in the promises it makes, but also they happen in the middle of real life. So if your kids are making it hard, or the grind is making it hard, or loss is making it hard, I want to tell you today that God wants to show up right in the middle of your situation with all kinds of hope, all kinds of presence, all kinds of faith, all kinds of encouragement, and you don't even have to fake it to, to receive it. Isn't that good? That's the authentic part. So at this place, we believe that God loves us just like we are. In England, this kept coming to me in every seminar I do. God anoints who you are, not who you think you're supposed to be. So if you're trying to be who you think you're supposed to be, and a lot of times there's a performance thing attached to motherhood or Christianhood, and you are trying to be who you think you're supposed to be, and you don't feel the anointing because that's not who you really are. He anoints you as you are. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So again, last time I make this disclaimer, some of this you would have heard before, but you haven't heard it quite this way. It's new in the way I'm rolling it out. This is fill, not kill, the law of endorsement. That's what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start here. This is the big story of God. The big story of God is indeed Jesus died on the cross for you. But it didn't start there. It started at God made a great world. It started at creation. God made Adam and Eve and a race for him to fellowship with. Adam and Eve fell and sold us all into that fallen state. But predetermined plan, lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Jesus came and redeemed us all. But look at that, there's a fourth leg of the story. It's not just fallen redemption, and it's not even just creation fallen redemption. There's also restoration. And you may think that's the new heavens and the new earth, but there's no time in the God realm, so that has begun now in you. So personally, that means there's a bunch of stuff God's trying to restore in you. He's not waiting until you get to heaven. He's restoring the way he made you in you. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that made you able to go to heaven starts long before you get there, working in you. In other words, he wants to make you human the way he intended you to be. So that's why I say fill, not kill. He wants to fill you, not just kill you. There was a death. Your old man did die, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's not the end of the story. You do see, don't you, that the church, the evangelical church, has majored on the two center pieces, fall and redemption, but they really haven't done much with creation and restoration. They, leave, they tend to leave that for heaven, and they leave creation to arguing over evolution. But it's a whole big story that goes together. I can tell that I'm not selling you totally, or you're thinking. So I'm going to go with the second one there that you're thinking. And we'll just move on. And hey, you don't have to be sold, but maybe by the end of this, you will have thought about it more. So if we believe that, then a question presents itself. And I don't know if this question ever presented itself to you, but it was sure a big part of my journey over the years. Okay, 
So, whoops, let's, I went to, there we go. Okay, so at the top, we have the view, we were messed up. We need a Savior bad. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Absolutely true. I'm not going to say but, that's just true. Are you with me? There, nothing wrong with that. It's just that that is the middle bit. Absolutely true in the middle bit. There's no way through except the cross, except Jesus, 100%. However, have you ever noticed you also hear you are made in the image of God. You are fear fearfully and wonderfully made. You're the apple of his eye in your uniqueness. He loves you and he really likes you. That whole message, has it ever seemed to you, I don't know if it has, but it did to me, that there were two things being told me. So let's just get real. Over here, man, you're bad. You suck without a savior. True. Over here, especially at women's uh, meetings, especially at women's meetings, God made you in his image. You're so wonderful. Well, sitting over here, sometimes you're going, yeah, not today. But if you only ever hear how bad you are, something is way missing. Because there's a creation, nobody was created to be bad. <laughs> is that, isn't that you that did that to me at um, Red's? Yes. Okay, this, this guy, <laughs> remind me your name, Don. I'd like you to meet Don, and I can tell you I'm going to do this because this man is not shy. So guess what he did to me? We went to Red's at lunch, me, Paul, and Tab. And Paul and Tab went up to order, and I grabbed a table because sometimes at Red's and Azel, it's hard to get a table. I grabbed a table. So he has a hat on. He comes lurking. <laughs> he comes lurking. He goes, I'm at a big empty table. He goes, this seat taken? And <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, they're up ordering. He goes, oh. And then he keeps standing there. And I'm going... <laughs> <laughs> go that far I just thought finally he kept saying stuff and I kept I didn't I didn't recognize him he had his hat on and I was out of it and I didn't recognize him and finally I go do you need this table because I'll move <laughs> I actually offered to move and finally I thought wait a minute and then he I don't know if he just had mercy on me or he could pull it off any longer I, I think he just had mercy on me he goes I go to your church and I was like <laughs> So oh, sorry I didn't recognize you. Did he tell you when he got home? Was he a little proud? He was a little proud. I th he Honestly, he pranked me so good. And I'm an only child. I'm easily pranked. And also, <laughs> I, go, I go, wait, what are we doing? I don't understand. I didn't grow up with brothers and sisters. What are we doing? And the point is, God likes him that way. You understand? God, I mean, I know... I know I'm saying it real basic, but sometimes, y'all, we don't get it, that God is not trying to transmute you into some spiritual form that you're not. And we have, that, listen, I, this is getting all real today up in here, but Paul and I went for a minute to Bible college before we went up to ORU, and um, do you know what the joke at Bible college is? Well, they, they, they actually, they did this at ORU, too. There was like a prayer room on every wing, and they, kids would go to the vent, you know, like there's a vent, and they would whisper through the vent pretending, I know this is, but pretending to be the voice of God, and they would go, Paul Brownback, go to Africa. <laughs> but what's sad is they assumed God's going to say, go the last place you think you want to go. When in fact, if God calls you to Africa, you will have burning heart desire for Africa. He knows how to do that. So God's not working against what wants to roll out of you. He's trying to enhance it so that you do it in the spirit, not in the flesh. God wants to anoint who you are, not who you think you ought to be. So over here, which is it then? That's a valid question. Well, obviously... Creation and restoration tells us it's both, but really 
that's the motive for the whole thing. God loves you so much, and he made you for a purpose. He made you a way for that purpose, and he wants to fully bring that out, not just in heaven, but on earth, because that's how he displays himself to the earth, through him living in you, through Don doing that at Red's. I'm not kidding. That's how he shows up in your skin. So you do need a death and resurrection, Because stuff got hold of you. Adam's sin had an effect on mankind. But he provided a fully effective redemption so that you can be the real you. Now, sometimes I think people aren't excited about that because they haven't seen who the real you is. Notice I made that at the red, that arrow, that says this is the motive. God's love of your uniqueness spans the whole thing. So I made it red like the blood of Jesus. But then I used this slide in England, and I told them, I, when I discovered the things about PowerPoint, I just fell in love with them, and embarrassingly so. Did you know that you can put a picture inside an arrow? You can fill a shape with any picture. So anytime I have a plain arrow, I'm motivated to do that. So I know, I know you want to be me right now. It's such a high-level skill, said no graphic designer ever. But the point is that God wants to release you with all the color and life that he put inside you. And the picture that is actually inside that arrow is this. This is called the Flammarion Engraving. I have a T-shirt that has it on it that Vanessa Parsons gave me, but it also says Third Eye Blind, And I didn't know if some of y'all could handle that this morning or not. Anyway, we'll skip that. I do own it. The Flammarion engraving was from an 1888 book about meteorology. It was actually a Renaissance engraving. They don't know who did it. But you can see it's it's a, a seeker, a pilgrim. It's somebody pushing out the boundaries to get out into the unseen. And I've always loved it. And then I found out, and this is probably why Third Eye Blind used it, uh, like the whole psychedelic generation loves it and uses it. I just thought it was a God thing when I saw it. I was like, dude, that's my life right there. Here's the thing. Sometimes we forget that Jesus takes us out of something to usher us into something. Jesus is the door, not just to escape, but to enter There's a whole world for you to enter. It's not just a world for you to escape. There's definitely stuff to escape. I know that people have things to walk out of in life, and we always want to help. But some of it is about knowing that there's something for you to walk into at the same time. So look at this. This is a scripture that tells us, it has a lot of out, not Uh, both in and out, and has fill, not kill in it. This is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. So there was a death, there was a kill, but Christ lives in me. There's a fill. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One um, translation says, the life that is in him I have shared his crucifixion. We'll say more about that in a minute. So this is the way I I said it. There's no I in team, but there is an I in Christ. See what I did there? Thank you. Who laughed? Thank you. You are my best friend. Thank you. Listen, I am here to get us to shut up about this false humility. You're you. You're supposed to be a good steward of you. And you'll do better at, oh, that's so cute. They've got, did you guys, what is this? Did you guys, they're making, they're holding up tens. They, (laughs) oh, Polly has one. Is this a conspiracy of, of goodness? How funny, how funny. Okay, everybody that has one, stand up and show everybody so they don't think I'm dreaming. Look what they did. (laughs) This is a mother's, I'll receive it. It's a, it's my Mother's Day present from you. I'm taking it as such. What was I saying? I was so verklempt by that. (laughs) Oh, um, you're you, and God's called you to steward you. And it just doesn't, we don't wear it well when we go, oh, I don't matter. It's only him. 
this is my personal again be of course we honor god as more important than us all those things but this is my personal um thing when a lot of people do this and i'm not down on them if they do but people will stand up to preach and they'll go lord i just pray that these words will be all you and no me i'm like we'll go home <laughs> i mean i'm i'm <laughs> i'm here to tell you these are a lot me but I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel that I had a call from God to show up with him. So we need to learn how to stop apologizing for the things he didn't ask us to apologize. He made you. He made you. Show up as you, totally drenched in and empowered by him. And you might say, well, where's the line? I don't know. It's a mystery. Work it. <laughs> Work it out. Work it out. You know, it's, it's like if... Um, um, uh, Simone Biles, let's say Simone Biles was going to perform a gymnastics routine and she thought, how much should I rely on training and how much should I rely on style? Why, why would she do that? She would go out and be the best she could of what she had inside her in the moment. And this is a lot like that. So I love that. There's no I in team, but there is an I in Christ. Right there. It's right there. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yes, it's a different eye than the one that was crucified. That was the old man, the debauched man, the messed up man. But there is an eye living now, and God is not going, quit talking about yourself so much. He's going, let's go on the adventure. Because he knows on the healthy adventure you're going to have with him, you're also going to care about other people. You're also going to be devoted. The things he wants in you will be pulled out as you go on the adventure. I'm... Just kidding, but not really, the slide says. So here's a picture of that. This is Numbers 21 in the Old Testament. And it's, I'll tell you the story, but just to say, John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So this story I'm about to tell you Jesus pointed to it and said, that's me, which should blow our mind. Jesus compared himself to the serpent on the pole. Mind blown. Okay, so what happened is the children of Israel were having a cheese and wine festival, meaning they were whining, that joke. <laughs> and, uh, and so fiery snakes came among them, and they were dying of snake bite that they basically brought on themselves because of their complaint. They were saying, why would you bring us out in the wilderness just to die? There's nothing to eat, things like that. We're tired of this food, all of that. Wine, cheese and wine. So Moses went to God, and he went, um, they're complaining and dying, and now they're crying because they're dying. What do you want me to do? And God said, Make a brass serpent and put it on a pole. You can read it. It's right in the pas passage, Numbers 21. And he said, everyone who looks will live. And Moses made a brass serpent, put it on a pole. Now we know as a picture of the one day to come Christ, mind blown. And that's exactly what happened. If they were bitten and they would have died, they looked at the serpent and lived. I hope that bends your mind a little. It should bend our minds every time we hear it. It bends mine. Did they repent? Did it say they repent? No, nope. it just said they looked. What did they do? That's a picture of the cross. When you look at the cross as the place, the thing that's biting you dies, you live. Isn't that beautiful? That's a picture. Jesus said, that's a picture of me. As Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. What did he take? Everything that's biting us. Everything we're dying from. He took the venom of life without him into himself on the cross, and he died with it there. And when we look at that cross with those eyes, we go, oh, everything that was against me was crucified with him. We live that's look and live. You can't get bigger than the cross. It's the center point of all time and eternity. And the cross showed up in the Old Testament in this story. What? How amazing. But here's the deal. We look at that and we go, oh, serpent, sin. I see that symbolism. I'm a Bible scholar. Yep. 
But can I point out to you, to those Israelites laying on the ground snake bit, that was a lot more personal. In other words, we think that symbolically represents, and it does. But to them, they were literally dying of bites from that thing. I want to submit to you today that God wants it to be, wants the global to go local in you. And everything that's biting you, whatever it is, if you haven't seen it yet as crucified with Christ, that opportunity stands open to you because it was. Your particular snake bite is already taken care of at the cross. And that's what the gospel is based on. So, I said this a few weeks ago in a transition. Now I have written it out for you. This is a great statement of what is going on for us. And it was made by The Who in 1971 in the song Bargain. I'd gladly lose me to find you. That's what the cross does for us. When we really see what he did for us at the cross, we go... I'd gladly lose me to find you. If, you. if you see it for real, that's what it works in you. I'd gladly lose me to find you is what anyone anytime says if they really see Jesus, and what he did at the cross. The next line says, I'd gladly give up all I've got. The inestimable value of the Savior is worth it all. And then that song goes on to say, I'd call that a bargain, the best I ever had. So that's grace part one. Here's grace part one. I don't care. Clean me, Lord. Shave off all the, the weird things. You know, shave off whatever you need to. I'd gladly lose me to find you. It's a bargain. I'll take it. I've seen what you're offering me, and I say a hearty yes. When we receive Jesus, we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, and the cross gets reproduced in us as a living reality. You look and live. You look and actually realize I was crucified with him, and now I've come back alive. But as you've heard, if you've come to a partner party, that is a grace beginning, and it's fantastic. But it also looks a bit like a graveyard. It's a little uniform. And as our mentor, Lynn Sweet, says, dullness is unbecoming a disciple of Jesus. This church ought to celebrate that. Jeff Summers, you ought to celebrate that. (laughs) Thank you. Dullness is unbecoming a disciple of Jesus because he's not dull. He's never dull. So here at the Abbey, we propose that rather than that, how about that? And they are still crosses. You, you may, you can hold up your tens now. <laughs> what have you created? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start calling for him. <laughs> Judges, I'll take a ten now. <laughs> uh, so if you look at these and you think, most people when they look at them, they immediately pick one and say, I'm that. But if you don't, and nothing in you even knows, then I just want to announce to you, you're, you're in for the ride of your lives as you discover. And notice that there's a, there's a plain white one here too. Because it's not like anybody's, there's all a range of personalities. We just need the plain white ones not to criticize the flamboyant ones. What are you holding up? Do you got You need a, Someone give that man a ten. I don't know. I need. <laughs> so, so here's the second part of the who speaking to us this morning. You didn't know they could, but here it comes, because this is another line of that same song. It just blew me away when I reheard it a few years ago. I'm looking for that free ride to me. I'm looking for you. I want to tell you this morning. Most of the church just goes, I'd gladly lose me to find you, and rightly so. But I want to be pioneering and pressing in to the part of the church that goes, I'm looking for that free ride to the real me. I'm looking for you. And I don't have time to spend dilly-dallying over worrying about religious 
performance because I've got a me that you made in me that wants to manifest in the earth. This is not just self-expression. Faith lives in the real you, not the one you're trying to be. It's a performance issue. We're not just saying, let's all be expressive and do art. Do art if you want to. Don't do art if you want to. It's not about that. It's about, it's really about what we believe about who Jesus is. It's about fill, not kill. So, thank you. Here's another line. Thank you. Here's another line. What happened? What is that? Oh, who gave you that? <laughs> I know he didn't have any cash. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? My reality's shaking. You two sings in Lights of Home from the album Songs of Experience. Free yourself to be yourself. And here's the kicker. If only you could see yourself. The Holy Spirit has promised that he will guide us in all truth. It does mean the Bible, but it also means all the truth about who I am. Because he said all truth, not just the stuff in the Bible. This is the stuff in the Bible coming through us. <laughs> Incarnation tab. So <laughs> Well, I'll just keep going, and maybe you'll keep getting. <laughs> There's lunch. <laughs> okay. Identity and destiny are two sides of the same coin, and both are only found in him. And here is the scripture that shows you that they're two sides of the same coin. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. That's your identity. You're his artwork. The expanded translation below that I'm not going to take the time to read tells you artwork, creation, masterpiece. It even is translated as masterpiece. That's who you are. That's your identity. You can't sit around and think you're nothing when you're his masterpiece. You may have been marred and messed up, but the cross has taken care of that. So let's get busy manifesting the masterpiece that you are in all its wonder, whether you mess with people at Reds or do other things. I'm just having fun. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God alone prepare, uh, for prepared that we should walk in them. We have an identity tailor-made for a destiny. There's nobody sitting here that doesn't have a destiny in God, and there's nobody sitting here that doesn't have an amazing identity in God, and they're two sides of the same coin. Isn't that beautiful? I put Starry Night up there, of course, by Van Gogh, because it is a masterpiece. And my story of that is when we went to MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, where Starry Night is, I checked in, because back then in that day, it was cool to check in on Facebook. It's not anymore. But used to, you'd go, I'm here in New York. I checked in at Times Square, and I was just like, I feel it. No one cared. But I did it. I checked in at MoMA. Immediately, a British friend uh, Facebook messaged me and, or commented on the check-in and said, make sure you see Starry Night. And I was just, I was being elite. And I was like, oh, bless your little heart. You just know Van Gogh. I know Matisse. And I know, you know, because I know all the art. So Starry Night, that's for beginning. I was a snob is what I was. I was being a snob. I was like, I want all of MoMA Cezanne. You know, I was really just not bad just low-key, like, oh, bless your heart. And then we start walking. And then God sneaks up on me because we go around and we see all the things and we go into a room and I don't know that on the middle wall behind me is actually Starry Night. So I go around the edge of the room and all of a sudden I turn around. And it wasn't just the painting, it was the crowd. They had, it had its own security guard. It is amazing. However, there were more people crowded around Starry Night than I've ever seen in any museum around one picture. And it was something about the picture that was almost generating worship. Look at that last line. Poema, which is the word for workmanship, we are his workmanship, we are his poema, comes from the word poio, which means to make or do in such a way that what is made takes on a life of its own. My British friend was right 
because Starry Night has taken on a life of its own. You know part of why I think that is? Because Vincent Van Gogh was a tortured man, but he loved God underneath it all. And studies have shown that was his view out his asylum window from the years he spent in the asylum. And I think something about painting that beauty, even when you're in a room for a painful cause, I think something makes that a masterpiece. But even beyond that, what I want to say today is you are his masterpiece. And a masterpiece is done in such a way that it takes on a life of its own. It is time for us to rise up and be excited about who we are in God. It is time for us, as messy as we are, with no faking it, to be, God, what masterpiece have you made me? And one of the hardest times of my life, early, early on in my 20s, I was going through a thing, and I'm praying to God, and I'm like, what is it? What scriptures do I need to confess? You know, as you do. I heard him say, Perian, I'm making you my masterpiece. And I thought, what does that have to do with right now? But somewhere in my heart, I realized he's got this. He's not just taking me out of things to make me a perfect specimen of good Christian living. He's painting a masterpiece that has a life of its own. And now it has a life of its own. Now there's, there's a God living in me that I understand how to cooperate with to a greater degree by far than I did in my 20s. That's the joy of this walk with him. He really wants to make every one of you his masterpiece. So the law of endorsement is Christ is in you as you. That's the miracle. A religious God is in you as him only. He is in you as him, but the miracle of our God, the incarnational God, the Jesus God, is that he's in you as you. Only Jesus could pull that off. Other religions, whatever their God is, if he's not even in them, but they don't make an offer of he's in you as you. Christ is in you as you because he made you and he brought you back to who you are meant to be. And this means this, both of these things go on throughout your whole life. It's not finish this and then go to this. It's all this. It's all this. He's killing what needs to be killed so he can fill what needs to be filled. But the main goal is fill, not kill. All right, now this, from here, I'm gonna, this is a word for our church based on all this. We talk a lot around here about familiarity versus intimacy. I think Tab mentioned it last week. Familiarity happens when we lose the honor of the other person. Intimacy is we see people in the spirit. We value and honor them. But how many of you know it's a left hemisphere thing? After you've seen it, you also can get familiar. You know what familiarity is? Listen, it's Mother's Day. We've all had them at our house. How many of you know the eye roll? And how many of you have done the eye roll? Moms do it too. So you can, you can roll your eyes at yourself. Have you ever rolled your eyes? I have rolled my eyes at myself so uh, adequately. You can roll your eyes at anything. In fact, the, the conditions of things that you could be familiar with, you could become overly familiar with faith. There's an eye roll of, oh, I've heard that scripture. I just heard that last week. <laughs> I heard that in the 70s. <laughs> That's a pretty bad. <laughs> That's a pretty bad eye roll. You could uh, become overly familiar with God. Maybe you don't roll your eyes in that one, but sometimes you think you know what he's going to do, but you don't because he surprises us. You could become overly familiar with others. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know that thing in your head that goes, here we go again. Here we go again. I know what they're going to do. I can see into this. These would be the suspicious minds. We can go on together. Have you ever had a suspicious mind in church? Somebody says something and you read 12 other things into it. You've become overly familiar. We all do it. Your left hemisphere is fantastic at this. Uh, but have you become overly familiar with yourself? We all have. I want to announce to you that in the Western world, most every one of us is overly familiar with ourselves. 
We think we know who we are, and God's going, I got more. I want to partner with you in that knowledge. The honor gets sucked out of us looking at ourselves, and we have a problem. If you are too familiar with yourself minus God's input, you have a problem because you, he wants to show you who you really are born to be. So I believe this is a word for the Abbey. God is calling us, you, us, to a deeper knowing that goes beyond mere familiarity. familiar. <laughs> say the word, that word, including and especially yourself. God wants you to have a new intimacy with him, with others, and with yourself. Listen, we have a lot of people in this church that have been together a long time. And so we have regular inputs of God waking us up to who we are so that there's not just eye rolls of, oh, that again. How many think in a family, you get to know each other so well in the, what we call the natural, it'd be great for the input of heaven to give you different eyes to see people. It makes life more fun. It's time to recover, restore intimacy by going deeper. And the scripture for that is deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. What does that tell me? That tells me there's a lot of noise to sort through to hear the real voice, the real signal. If you're still down on yourself, then you don't yet know yourself for real. Because God wants to show you the good inside you. So, do you know there's a thing called a deep fake now? Have you heard of this? AI has made it possible for there to be deep fakes. Some of them can be scams. Some of them, a lot of scams are these. A deep fake is generated by a special kind of machine learning called deep learning that involves hidden layers, they call it hidden layers, and deep neural networks because it's designed to replicate how the human brain learns. So all artificial intelligence is mimicking how our brains work. And there are algorithms out there that create an image, but not the right image. And I just want to submit to you that I think the enemy and our own thoughts have deep faked us about who we are. I think there's lies that have been thrown at us about our lack of worth, our lack of capability, our lack of, you know, friends. All these lies are a deep fake. And the enemy mimics neural networks and gets us thinking that they're real. This is what's being actively used to scam people. There are even um, cases where somebody gets a message that's the voice and face of a relative saying they're in prison somewhere and they need thousands of dollars to get out. Deep fake. But I'm going to tell you, there's nothing AI can't do that the devil's not already tried just in the air. He's tried to deep fake us. So even though we have Jesus, he's tried to deep fake us into thinking we're a pathetic representation of a Christian. When in fact, God just loves us and wants to show us off and work in us. There's deep fakes. He sold us. There's some deep neural networks, hidden layers in our learning. But I believe this morning that this is a word for the Abbey, that he wants to take us deeper than the deep fake. I believe he's a, there's a place for every one of us that is the deep real. I believe God is calling us, worship team, you guys can go ahead and come, to go deeper. There's something deeper than who you think you are. There's who you really are in him. Let me read how I, how I wrote this out. Don't leave your knowledge of yourself as a deep fake. Don't be scammed by the enemy's artificial version of you that doesn't include God. Have you gone deep and discovered things in yourself or others that's disappointed you? There's something deeper. Let's go deeper than the deep fake and go to the deep real. 
Deep calls to deep, Psalm 42, 7 again, at the roar of your water spouts, whatever your conclusion about who you are and how you are, if it's, if it's not made in God, God's calling you this morning to go deeper. There's a deep reel. And I believe, I want to prophesy that I believe this church has had an unction and anointing on it, but I believe it's going to go to another level to see people as God sees them. I believe people that have been deep faked and lied to by religion and come in here feeling condemnation with their head hanging low, I believe they're going to walk in the door and somehow start going, wait, I may not be who I thought I was. Maybe there's some good in me. (laughs) Maybe I was made in the image of God. Maybe I'm not a failure. Maybe there's hope. Maybe there never was a reason for me to hide and not be around church. Maybe in the past there was a reason, but I believe we are on the verge of some deep real. And I want to commission you if that's the truth. People need this, y'all. People are hurting. People need to be loved for who they are, seen for who they are in God, whether they've manifested it yet or not. When they walk in the doors, they need to not be fearing judgment because it's already taken care of at the cross. But it may not start for them until somebody sees deeper than the deep fake. That, you know what, that's what prophecy is. Listen, there's all kinds of rules or guidelines, I should say, about don't go give prophetic words. And yeah, please don't give weird prophetic words and go, you're gonna move to so-and-so. And, you know, don't be doing directional private prophetic words. But, but I wanna commission every one of you <laughs> It's just as prophetic to walk up and say, I see a gift in you. You have a gift of kindness. You have a gift of love. I'm doing it right now. That's real. I, I want to commission everybody at the Abbey to walk in these doors and not just go, hey, how are you? You can do that too. I mean, I'm not good at it, but <laughs> I just go, I, <laughs> I just go, Chapman Beam, you have leadership in you. You have so much leadership in you. And God gave you that tall stature that he gave you so that a booming voice would come out of you and affect a generation and you've not begun to see what you have in your hands and in your heart and in your mouth yet. Now that's not going to send him into any weirdness. That's prophetic encouragement. Y'all, could we stop being weird as a church? You're not weird. I just think it'd be refreshing for a charismatic church to just love people and prophesy unconsciously. You don't have to go. I, listen, I didn't come with this, but here it is. You don't have to go, thus saith the Lord, I feel. Just see them. Do you like it? I'm glad because I didn't, yeah. Just see them. And you can do it at Starbucks. Just, again, please leave the histrionics out of there. Just go. I've, I've done this all over the place. I, I just go, man, there's something in you that's just full of sunshine to strangers. That is every bit as prophetic as the things we make a big deal about. I'm not saying there's not real prophetic words. There are, but don't do those whispered in the near in the, in the corner. Do this stuff all over each other. Encourage. <laughs> It won't stop. Can we keep going? If you think you have a word that is like, I see danger and trouble coming, there's something God's not, that's not him. Don't do it. Go pray. Shut up and go pray. Trying to pull the charismatic church out of everybody's weirdo bucket because we ought to be the best at seeing people and releasing them into who they really are. If, I'm going to use my dear friend Laura Montgomery as an example. If somebody wanted to say to Laura, Laura, you're too analytical, it's hindering God. They need to shut up and go pray because that's wrong. That is not how God talks to her. What I would say to God is everything that comes out of your mouth was God meeting you in that deep analysis that he's gotten hold of in your life. And you have blessed the world and you bless people out in education with an anointed version of how God shows up in a school, in administration.
administration and science and all the things. Listen, that's what the love endorsement is about, y'all. I, I wrote the love endorsement. I only called it that because John Maxwell had a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of, what is it? Leadership. And I just thought, he made those up. So I made it up. But the bigger thing is, I really believe this is how Christ in us, the hope of glory, wants to show up in the Abbey. Y'all on board with this? What if we were so doggone real that God just was all over it? If this is scaring anyone, I care. I do. We're going to do a thing at the end to let you act on this, specifically in terms of Mother's Day. We have some hosts that are going to bring out um, some carnations. Tab said I should call them incarnations. She did that right before service. She cracked me up. Um, we're going to put these out. Usually, we pass them out to all the moms. But this year we just felt like let's 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 act on this differently. You can't there's gonna be two over here and two over here. They're as multicolored as we could attain. And we wanna release you to do anything you want with them. For sure, get one for your mom or yourself. If you're a mom and you're here alone, get one for yourself. But even more than that just want to challenge you to pray or, or sense who you could encourage with one of these and who you could show that they are seen. Today's exercise is hoping that we will rise above just honoring Mother's Day as we properly should into really seeing people, which would make Mother's Day and every day better. Paul, why don't you why don't you come pray before we dismiss people to come and get a carnation and ooh, make it incarnation like it really works, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's stand up together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus did come to redeem us. So that he could fill us. So he could restore us to your purpose and plan for our life. I pray over every person here today and every person online that's tuning in. Father, for the scales to fall off our eyes. The lies of the enemies to, to fail and to fall and a revelation of the truth of your purpose your identity and your destiny to be revealed in our life that each person would begin to see themselves in your eyes and go deeper in faith instead of the fake want to declare over you, we break those areas where the enemy has faked you out. We break them in the name of Jesus. We declare that right now they are broken. And even as they have been there, those deep areas where the enemies faked you out and made you believe a lie about yourself, there's a bunch of performance that some of you have been trying to do against that lie. And that breaks off too. So we call for the deep real. We just call for the deep real, for this church to see each other. We will also see ourselves in God. Yes, in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen, amen. So come and you can get one flower. Make sure, yes, take flowers to moms. Also, if you want to take a flower and give it to somebody and say, I see in you this gift, this anointing, this 
part of the way God made you, then take that and give it to somebody. Bless somebody today. And then be free to be dismissed whenever you get done doing that. service today. We are so thankful for you and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.